All right, so you want to do a deep dive into Diagon Alley. Chapter 5 of Sorcerer's Stone. Awesome. I think we can definitely help you prep for that class discussion you mentioned. Definitely a pivotal chapter. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even for longtime fans like myself, every time I reread this chapter, it's like peeling back new layers and uncovering little details I never noticed before. There's just so much packed in there. It really is the foundation for the whole series, you know? It introduces us to so many key elements of the wizarding world and sets up all these events that'll unfold later on, foreshadowing galore. You hit the nail on the head with foreshadowing. It starts with Harry's life with the Dursleys. We talk about dreary, and then suddenly, bam, we've got the Daily Prophet arriving by Owl. That Owl, though, right? Not just a cool magical detail. It speaks volumes about how this whole society functions, you know? Communication is key in the wizarding world, but it has to be secret, right? Right. Like their own secure network, no muggle interceptions. Exactly. Fast, reliable, discreet. It's like their version of email, but way cooler, obviously. Yeah. And so much more stylish than just sending an email. Oh, for sure. And then there's Gringotts. I mean, what a place to make your entrance into the magical economy. Seriously. And it's run by goblins. Not exactly the friendliest creatures, are they? Nope. Goblins are known for being shrewd, fiercely protective of their treasure. They're not messing around when it comes to security. It really sets the stage for a world where magic isn't all sunshine and rainbows, right? Definitely not. There are consequences, power dynamics at play that Harry is completely oblivious to at this point. Absolutely. Like, remember that little detail about Gringotts only checking for trapped individuals every 10 years? Oh, yeah. Creepy. It makes you wonder how many poor souls might be stuck in those vaults, forgotten. And that they only check every 10 years. It speaks to their priorities, right? Yeah. Security and wealth above all else. And speaking of wealth, this is where Harry learns about his inheritance. Quite a contrast to the Dursleys complaining about how much it costs to raise him. Yeah. Talk about a slap in the face, huh? It really highlights their hypocrisy and their complete fear of anything magical. They try to keep Harry in the dark, but ultimately, mm. it's all about their own insecurities, isn't it? I think so. Trying to cling to this illusion of normalcy. So we've got Harry with his newfound fortune. But then there's this whole other mysterious element in Gringotts Vault 713. Hagrid retrieves this package for Dumbledore, super secretive about what's inside. Classic Rowling, mm -hmm. the queen of foreshadowing. Right. It just screams, this is important, this is going to come back later in a big way. Mm -hmm. What do you think was in that package? Ooh, good question. That's something I bet your professor is going to ask you. Definitely someone to ponder. Let me jot down some theories before class. You'll be ready to impress. Exactly. Brainstorm. Anyway, we've got Harry with his gold, this mysterious item from Vault 713. And then what happens? We step into... Diagon Alley. I mean, who hasn't dreamed of experiencing that? It's like this explosion of sights and sounds and smells. Everything you could possibly imagine in the magical world, all tucked away in this hidden street. It's like stepping into another dimension, you know? Hidden in plain sight. And it really highlights this whole idea of a secret society existing alongside the muggle world. Yeah, I love how Rowling creates this contrast between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Uh -huh. Like Hagrid trying to use those muggle binoculars. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a classic scene. It's hilarious. But it also serves as a reminder that Hagrid is kind of an outsider, too. He straddles both worlds, just like Harry. Totally. He's a bridge between these two worlds. And even in this wondrous place like Diagon Alley, there are hints of danger, right? Like those hushed whispers about dragon liver being sold at exorbitant prices. Yeah. Makes you wonder what else is going on in those shady back alleys. Oh, definitely. Not everything is as bright and shiny as it appears. There's a darkness lurking beneath the surface, which is something to keep in mind as Harry explores this new world. Right. And it's not just dark shops. Remember what Hagrid says about trying to rob Gringotts? Spells, enchantments, maybe even dragons guarding those vaults. Oh, yeah. That's a great example of how Rowling injects those subtle bits of danger. She doesn't shy away from the darker aspects of this world, which I think adds to the realism and makes it that much more captivating. Totally. It's not all fun and games. There are real stakes here. It's easy to forget that Harry's just a kid thrown into this crazy new world. Totally. It's overwhelming for anyone, but imagine being 11 and finding out that magic is real and yeah. you're famous in this whole other society. It's a lot to process. And then, of course, we have Hagrid, not just there to guide Harry, but also to protect him. Yeah. He's like a mix between a bodyguard and a cool uncle, you know. Mm. I always love that he buys Harry his first birthday present ever. Hedwigs. Yes. And the owl isn't just a pet. I mean, it's like a symbol of freedom and connection. 
you know, being able to communicate with the rest of the wizarding world. It's a really important gift. Maybe something worth mentioning for your class discussion. Oh, definitely. Symbolism is always a good angle. Now, are you ready for the main event? All of Anders. <laughs> I mean, this is the moment we've all been waiting for, right? Yeah. Ollivander's is more than just a shop, you know? It's like the sacred space. Exactly. And Ollivander himself is such a fascinating character, almost eerie with his knowledge of wands. Yeah. Like he can see right through you. And the way he talks about the wand, choosing the wizard, it's not just about finding a wand that looks cool. It's about this deeper connection, like destiny. The magical bond. And when Harry finally finds his wand, the one that chooses him, it's incredible. That shower of sparks, red and gold. Pure magic. Do you remember what Ollivander says? Curious. Yeah. Very curious. I get chills every time I read that line. Mm -hmm. You just know something big is about to happen. And then boom. The bombshell. Harry's wand shares a phoenix feather core with Voldemort's wand. Talk about foreshadowing. It's this instant link between them, even though they haven't even met yet. I mean, seriously, how does Rowling come up with this stuff? It's genius. It instantly raises the stakes and connects their destinies in this profound way. Definitely a point to bring up in your class. It's like a symbol of their intertwined fates. You yeah. Know? And the choices they make. One wand used for good, the other for evil. Oh, for sure. That's a great point. Even with a shared origin, it ultimately comes down to the individual's choices. And don't forget that chilling line from Ollivander when he says, It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why its brother gave you that scar. Uh -huh. He's connecting the wand to Harry's past, to the loss of his parents, and the mark Voldemort left on him. Ugh, I know, it's heavy stuff. But it also highlights the fact that even in this magical world, there's pain, loss, and this constant struggle against darkness. Exactly. It's not all sunshine and butterbeer. So as they leave Ollivander's, what does Harry say? Something like, everyone thinks I'm special, but I don't know anything about magic at all. Yeah, poor kid. You can feel his anxiety. He's got this incredible power, but doesn't know how to use it. Right. He's thrown into the spotlight, hailed as the boy who lived, but inside he's just a lost kid. It's a great point for discussion, actually. Think about how Harry's lack of knowledge and his sudden fame make him vulnerable. He's walking into Hogwarts with a target on his back. Yeah. And it's right when Harry's feeling all this uncertainty that we meet Draco Malfoy. Ah, uh, Draco. In Madame Malkin's robe shop. Yep. Everything Harry's not. Mm. Arrogant, entitled, obsessed with blood purity. Yeah. He's like this poster child for the darker side of the wizarding world. Right from the Oh, camp. totally. That whole first encounter is fascinating. The way he tries to size Harry up, yeah. asking those loaded questions about his family, like he's looking for any reason to dismiss him. Classic elitist move. Yeah. Judging someone based on their lineage. And he doesn't even try to hide it. Bragging about being cure blood, his family's history in Slytherin. Like it's some exclusive club. Right. And then he dismisses houses like Hufflepuff. As if they're beneath him. But it's not just what he says. It's his actions, too. Remember how he treats Hagrid, yeah. calling him a sort of servant? Ugh, I know. So disrespectful. It really shows that prejudice goes beyond blood purity. It's about anyone who doesn't fit into their narrow definition of what a wizard should be. Yeah. It's a good point to bring up in class. How Draco's attitude toward Hagrid foreshadows the bigger conflicts that Harry will face later on. You know, totally. It's not just about fighting evil wizards. It's about challenging these deep seated prejudices, yeah. fighting for inclusivity, acceptance. Exactly. Oh, and there's this one detail that always stands out to me. Draco wants a racing broom. Even though first years aren't allowed to have them. Right. Like he thinks the rules don't apply to him. Typical Draco. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? Because it foreshadows Harry's own passion for Quidditch. Sets up that rivalry between them. Right. On and off the field. And symbolically, it represents that bigger battle between those who want to bend the rules for their own gain and those who try to play fair. Ooh, that's good. We'll write that down for class. Okay. Okay. So we've got Draco, the future rival, hints of those larger themes. And then... There's Harry's encounter with Professor Quirrell. Poor Quirrell. He seems so timid, right? Yeah, but remember, he wasn't always like that. He took that year off before teaching at Hogwarts, supposedly to gain some firsthand experience. And ran into some trouble. Yeah. Vampires. A hag. Something definitely happened that left him shaken. It's like he's teaching defense against the dark arts, but he's terrified of the subject himself. Right, and that makes him vulnerable. Easily manipulated. Which we'll see play out later, of course. Oh, yeah. And remember that little detail, he needs a new book on vampires. Yeah. 
foreshadowing much. It hints at those darker forces lurking in the background, things that Harry's going to have to deal with eventually. So much packed into this one chapter. It's incredible. Future rivals, hidden dangers, mm. and all these complex social dynamics. It's what makes Rowling's writing so brilliant. Right. She creates this world that's both magical and incredibly real. And I think what really sticks with me is Harry's vulnerability. He's famous, but he doesn't know anything about magic. He's surrounded by people who either put him on a pedestal or want to see him fail. Yeah, it really makes you think. What does it really mean to be a hero? And how do our choices shape our destiny, even in a magical world? Exactly. So there you have it, a deep dive into Diagon Alley. Tons of stuff to think about for your class discussion. Symbolism, foreshadowing, the nature of heroism. Hopefully this gave you some ideas to really impress your professor. Oh, yeah. And for everyone else listening, we hope you enjoyed exploring Diagon Alley with us. Until next time. <laughs>